Välkomna! Eh, som jag förstår så talar alla svenska här inne. Ingen som opponerar sig. Jag förstod kanske inte vad jag sa. <laughs> eh, välkomna till Jonas Ljungblads miss-seminarium. Eh, ja, förutom Jonas, naturligtvis huvudperson, så har vi en betygsnämnd från då Ing Rostik. Vad är det Mia Folke. Och Mats Björkman. De som har varit fina handledare så här långt, och kanske fortsättningsvis också, är Bertil, musik från Högt Instrument, Magnus och jag som är mitt eh, Dagens aktiviteter, förmiddagsaktiviteter, är tänkta som så. Att Jonas håller ett föredrag, presenterar den forskning vi har bedrivit som resultat. På ungefär halvtimme. Kim och Clay. Snabba på. Aha. <laughs> eh, det föredraget kommer att ske på engelska. Vi har en inspelning av detta så vi kan visa det senare. Därefter är det betygsnämnden som har äran att ställa lite frågor. Eller Mia som, förlåt, Mia som opponent som kommer att berätta lite grann om vad detta har för inverkan på världen i samhället, för en diskussion sedan med respondenten. Och därefter är det betygsnämnden som ställer frågor. Och sen är det upp till var och en att ställa frågor. Efter Jonas presentation nu så tar vi en 3-4 minuters bensträckare så att Jonas som filmar kan tas ut helt obemärkt. Då! Thank you. Uh, so there's a lot of Jonas today because we have the cameraman up there and me and the storm outside. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about my, uh, re my uh, research and my licentiate uh, called High Performance Breath Analysis. And um, uh, I work with uh, Mostly, I work with uh, alcohol detection in the human breath. And uh, I work towards both the automotive industry and to other applications. Uh, the main motivation with working with breath alcohol analysis is to save lives. Uh, if you look in the graph to the left here, you see that the, the mm, the risk of being in a car accident increases dramatically with increased uh, alcohol concentration in the human body. Uh, and uh, to the right, you see the, uh, the percentage of, um, of traffic fatalities due to uh, alcohol intoxication uh, in the USA. So, uh, uh, today and over the last two decades, about 40% of all fatalities on American roads were due to alcohol involvement. Uh, and that's a trend that's not going down. So something has to be done to stop, uh, to prevent that, this dramatic uh, percentage. And I should also say that it's up, it's, um, and the total number of deaths are in excess of 10,000 10, per year in the USA. And one, uh, one proposed methodology to deal with this is to use uh, carbon dioxide as a tracer gas and uh, thereby to account for the dilution of a breath sample. And by doing so, you can remove the mouthpiece from the alcohol breath analyzer. So that's one step to making it easier to use a breath alcohol instrument, uh, which would probably, it's a probable way in order to, uh, to uh, gain acceptance by a broader audience and make more and more people use these kind of instruments. Um, so I've been working with a sensor uh, in this project and in my research based on IR technology. And uh, in IR technology, 
you utilize the fact that uh, certain molecules, they absorb uh, light in the IR spectrum. And that absorption is very specific to that uh, specific compound. And both carbon dioxide and uh, alcohol, ethanol, is, uh, do have absorption in the IR region. Uh, so IR spectroscopy is a viable path to do so. And you need a sensor to be able to measure, me measure both carbon dioxide and alcohol. And the sensor used throughout this project so far has been the, the one that you can see up in the right corner. Uh, uh, and to measure alcohol in the diluted breath, uh, that uh, requires high accuracy and uh, high, high resolution. And uh, one way to gain resolution is to have a long optical path of the traveled light. Uh, so the sensor is designed as a white cell. In, uh, and that's illustrated in the lower right corner here. And that design allows for a long optical path in a compact design. Um, so within my research, I've been trying to answer these three uh, research questions. And the first question is uh, related to the actual performance of the sensor itself. Uh, so I've been... Um, I've been performing laboratory experiments to evaluate the sensor performance. And the second question is more related to the interaction between the sensor and the human who is intended to breathe into the device. So in that, uh, to answer that question, a human subject study has been performed. And in the third question has been investigated by, uh, by also by human subject studies, but sober humans. Uh, and uh, in a vehicle environment. So I'm going to try to answer one, each of these questions at one at a time, starting with the first question. Uh, so the first parameter that was an analyzed uh, was the sensitivity of the device. Uh, and the sensitivity was evaluated using this setup here where the sensors were placed inside a closed compartment and uh, alcohol was applied to the compartment with a pipette uh, in liquid form and allowed to evaporate. And in that way, a highly a, 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 a alcohol uh, gas was created. Uh, and in the graph to the right, you can see the results from 131 sensors. Uh, and the, the error bars in the y direction, they so show the th three sigma variation uh, between all of these sensors at each of these concentrations. And um, the dotted lines here, they show an error of approximately of 10% from the fitted line. And um, if you relate that to what's uh, stated in industrial standards, uh, that's how accurate an alcohol interlock should be uh, with a mouthpiece. So even without calibration, these sensors exhibit very good uh, uh, performance in, with it, this respect. So. The second uh, parameter that was analyzed was the resolution. And um, the resolution is set by the noise floor in the sensor. So in this figure here is the Allen deviation in which the, uh, the resolution is uh, on, the, on the y axis actually. And the, the integration time, if you use an average of different time windows over a sampled signal, uh, you'll get this type of behavior. Uh, and uh, the further you use, the, the longer averaging filter you use, the higher resolution you get from the sensor. And, um, and that's on the downward slope, and that's for the more stochastic noise. Uh, and if you look at the other part over there, you will get the, the more long-term drift and disturbances will be more dominant if you use a too long of a window. 
And in a human breath, a breath test is about uh, a few seconds. So the arrow up here shows uh, the resolution at one second. And uh, the resolution is 0 0.001 milligrams per liter. And that is about 1% of the Swedish legal limit. So the sensor is, uh, has more than enough resolution to detect alcohol, even in diluted breaths. Uh, and the, the sensor also needs to respond quickly to a gas pulse. So that's what's shown in, in this image here. You have two, two gas pulses, one that is undiluted and one that is diluted. And uh, the response time was determined to be less than, than uh, half a second. So again, that's enough to detect the human breath. Uh, and what's also shown in this image is that both gases mixes properly. They have, the same, they have the same dilution in the second breath compared to the first one. Uh, and I also talked a bit about industrial standards and they are written for, for uh, devices that have a mouthpiece, of course. But if you look at the sensitivity, the selectivity of, uh, in that, uh, in those standards, uh, the, the devices, they have to fulfill a few of those requirements with respect to selectivity. Uh, and the compounds that are listed are both of um, endogenous and exogenous origin. And uh, the sensor proposed shown here uh, only had one issue, and that's uh, related to methanol at the end with the standard for evidential equipment. Uh, and that's the only diverg divergence compared to those. So the sensor itself uh, fulfills the requirements for sc screening applications uh, with regards to accuracy, resolution, selectivity, and response time. Uh, and the second, <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a beautiful uh, model here. <laughs> She's also in the audience. <laughs> uh, so the, the second question was answered, uh, investigated using a, um, a human subject study. Uh, so the study was, uh, in the study, 30 subjects were recruited uh, out of which 19 were male and 11 female. And uh, in the study protocol, the subjects came into the lab at, uh, in the morning, early in the morning, and they were giving a do dosage of alcohol to, uh, to allow for an, uh, estimate, a, 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 um, a peak alcohol concentration above the American legal limit of 0 0.4 milligrams per liter. Uh, the subjects were told to breed in three different ways into the device. First undiluted, secondly at a distance of approximately three centimeters, and thirdly at approximately 15 centimeters. Uh, and then into reference instrument and the data was thereafter compared to the reference instrument. And uh, each of these sets were repeated for every 20 minutes during the alcohol <coughs> elimination phase, uh, which is so shown as the downward slope here in the image to the left. So, uh, these are the results from that study. Uh, and uh, if you take it from the right to the left here, you, you see the undiluted tests in both the upper and the lower panel. It's the same data. Uh, and uh, in the middle, you have the three centimeter distance tests and 15 centimeters in the left uh, graph. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is a increase in variation. Uh, 
uh, as you use the diluted test. Uh, and the difference between the diluted and the undiluted is, of course, the use of, a, of, the, of carbon dioxide as the tracer gas. But you can also see that the variation slightly increases uh, when you go to the long test, the, the tests at 15 centimeters. Uh, and uh, there is also these gray, uh, gray zones uh, in each of the graphs. And in the upper panel, those gray zones represent, uh, rep or uh, it's placed around the Swedish legal limit for uh, drunk driving at 0 0.1 milligrams per liter. Uh, and uh, the gray zone represents the functional test in the standard for alcohol interlocks for devices having a mouthpiece. So, uh, and that is, uh, the functional test is performed without, with, with a gas pulse. So this is with physiology as well, physiolo physiological errors as well. Uh, and uh, if you use the, the alcohol interlock as a classifier, which you do in many cases, where you set the limit and uh, then it's either above or below that limit, um, th and allow for that error within around the, the legal limit, then no falsely classified results were recorded for any of the undiluted tests. And neither were, were um, any, any falsely classified results recorded for the tests recorded at, uh, at uh, three centimeters distance from the sensor. Uh, in the long, at the long distance, however, there was one falsely classified test. Uh, and in the lower panel, uh, you see the same limits and the same method methodology to look at the data uh, around the European legal limit at 0 0.25 milligrams per liter. And in this region, again, no falsely classified results were shown for the undiluted tests. However, for the diluted tests, about 1.7% of the tests were falsely classified. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, the carbon dioxide is, is a dominating source for variation in the diluted samples. And what's shown here, perhaps it's a bit small, but uh, what's shown here is, um, is the measured carbon dioxide concentration for all the undiluted tests, uh, and it's grouped on the individuals. Uh, so what you can see straight away is that uh, there is uh, a few percent, uh, about 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, variation between individuals. And the same is true within each individual. Uh, so you have both a physiological, two different types of, of uh, variation that's present in this situation. So to account for these two types of variation, uh, one method would be to, uh, to uh, calibrate each device to the individual uh, and uh, what some sort of, um, <coughs> of uh, identification tag could be used in combination with the, with the alcohol device to reduce the variation. And uh, the, other so the other thing that you can do is that you rely more on the alcohol signal. So you can weigh the result with the alcohol signal as well. And by doing so, you can reduce the <coughs> total variation of the, of the measurements by up to 40%, because these two techniques can, used in, can be used in the combination with one another. Uh, so, uh, so what's been f <laughs> what I found out regarding question two is that uh, the sensor can be used in two different modes, either with and without carbon dioxide as a tracer gas, uh, and thereby 
many applications. We, we can adapt the, the sensor to many applications, uh, depending on, on the need of that application, of course. Uh, and uh, when using the diluted uh, methodology, uh, the variation can be reduced by these two uh, techniques that I just mentioned. So, in the third question, uh, I investigated uh, uh, the use of the sensor in a more passive solution. So, several sensors were placed inside the vehicle compartment around the driver, and uh, a driver were a person where um, uh, a sober person uh, went inside and sat down in the driving seat and the signals were logged. Both the carbon dioxide signal was logged for a period of time. And uh, the peak uh, concentration, the peak CO2 concentration was measured. And thereby the, the, um, uh, the estimated dilution of the sample could be, uh, could be found. Uh, and uh, in doing so, the best place to position a sensor was to place it here on the chest, uh, attached to the driver, to the seatbelt. Uh, and that position is obviously quite difficult to handle uh, when it comes to integration. Uh, but uh, if you look at other positions, such as the steering wheel, which is an obvious choice for integration, uh, you would need a you would need to uh, to measure alcohol in a diluted sample of about uh, eighty to one hundred in order to make it a passive system. So it's quite high dilution, and therefore the system needs to be uh, very the very high resolution of the system. Uh, so. Uh, however, it has been shown here that it is feasible, given enough resolution, to detect a, uh, a breath in a passive uh, system. Uh, but it uh, requires more development in order to, to reach the goal. And you might also need uh, some sort of um, other sensors around it to, to know that, that's, uh, that the gas is uh, coming from the driver instead of the passenger and stuff like that. So that also needs to be investigated uh, in order to make a system more passive. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs>